Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the second week of Digital X ADB. This is the Asian Development Bank signature event that brings together technology and people. Uh, my name is uh, Mark. I'm the principal IT specialist at the ITD Sandbox program. Uh, today's session promises to be quite an exciting one, focusing on decentralized digital finance. In this session, we want to unpack the role digital technologies can play in enhancing access to finance, especially development finance. Uh, for that, we have lined up for you a very interesting uh, list of speakers and panelists. During this session, uh, we'll hear different perspective on digital finance and especially its more recent development, decentralized finance. You'll also hear from our very own ADB head of trade finance program about his vision for digital technology. Uh, to get us started, uh, we'll start with a presentation by a very distinguished speaker with a strong academic background, but also tremendous professional experience in the field of digital technology. So allow me to welcome David Lee, who is a professor from the Singapore University of Social Science. Over to you, David, please. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And I'm about to share my slides. I will go straight into... Uh, the 10 minutes uh, that's allocated to me about decentralized finance. Okay. Well, um, these are the three points I want to make. One is that it's an alternative financial infrastructure built on top of a public smart contract platforms such as the Ethereum blockchain. And it is open, transparent, no intermediaries, decentralized and interoperable. And the backbone of DeFi is smart contracts. And we can see that the total value has increased by 10 times in just less than a year. And a lot of tension has been in this area. But today we're gonna to focus a little bit more about what this is. If you look at the diagram from the left side, at the bottom, you have the asset layer and settlement layer. That is very uh, easy for us to understand from traditional finance as, the, as a settlement and also as a uh, clearing and payment structure that we have at the protocol level, which is all decentralized, is very much similar to the licensed institutions. And then at the application layer and aggregation layer will be the apps uh, in our centralized economy. However, in the DeFi, everything is decentralized. There's no central authority except the codes that's um, looking into the governance. Well, the smart contract behavior is such that it will be executed as specified and allow anyone to verify and anyone to view and audit. And execution will lead to the change in the distributed ledger or in this case, in the Ethereum, the blockchain. And it will be captured and is immutable uh, because of uh, cryptography. And it is atomic in a sense, you'll hear about this word atomic all the time. It just means that the state change either succeed or revert, reverted. And we talk about state is because it's not only the state of the coin, but also the state of all the codes which the smart contract has executed. When there's no change in the state, then you don't have to pay for the smart contract. However, when it changes, you will have to pay uh, by so-called the gas and it's actually uh, the ether, in, which is the coin in the Ethereum. Well, asset tokenization is adding new assets to the blockchain by smart contract. So when you do that, uh, the resulting digital asset is known as a crypto token. A crypto token is not a payment token. So uh, a crypto token is a token created by smart contract, but ETA is not a token, although generally people uh, treat it as a payment token because ETA is native to the distributed ledger, the blockchain, but it is not a token, it is a coin, okay? Now, when you're, you're de when you're in decent, decentralized exchange or DEX, there's no price discovery. So what do you do? You just submit the buy order, send it by smart contract. There will be a li liquidity pool. Uh, and, and what they will do is that from the liquidity pool, the, co the, code, the coding will find the, the matching and therefore they will mint it and use it as a source collateral and issue to the user through a command called set protocol not only in a pair, but they can be in multiple of pairs or in even in uh, um, as many tokens as you wish. And then there'll be exchange that's being done uh, through the smart contract. And remember it's atomic in the sense that it's either completed or it is not completed for the execution. 
There are two types of token. One is known as fungible token, and Ethereum is called ERC20. And vast majority of the tokens that you see are ERC standard, ERC20 standard. And this is the type of fungible tokens, which means that uh, it's interchangeable and have no unique properties. The other type is to track the ownership and is unique to track your car, the painting, digital painting and so on. It's known as ERC721 uh, standard in the Ethereum. Okay. Now in the decentralized exchange, uh, there are a few things that we need to know. One is that there will be market maker, but they're automatic. Okay, so it's automated market maker. They create and run uh, openly access, uh, accessible on-chain liquidity. They provide the liquidity. They write the codes as well. They allow users to switch tokens using computer codes, which is a smart contract. And you can earn uh, passive income via the trading fees for the liquidity providers. And since there's no price discovery, how do you determine uh, the exchange rate? Well, there are formulas. One of the most popular is the constant product market maker, for example, in Uniswap. And this K is invariant where you have the two tokens multiplying each other together. Let me give you an example. If you have to multiply the two tokens together and equal to 16, I'm sorry, not 18 there, then it's four times four is equal to 18. If I wish to sell four of these yellow tokens, and I put four, four in there, I will be able to take out two of that because it's again, eight times two is equal to 16 because the K is always constant. However, by doing so, I've changed the exchange rate from one to one to one to 0 0.5 for this yellow token. So that's the, how the way the pricing is being done. However, we have more liquidity. If you put in four, it means you want to sell for, your depreciation will be less. And this is the formula uh, that you use, but there are many, many different types of formulas that you can use. Uh, what we just mentioned is this formula, okay, which is the constant price, but there are others such as the stable swap invariant, which, which give a lot more flat surface here where the exchange rate is almost constant while there's a lot of liquidity, but when liquidity dries up, uh, it was the exchange rate would trade uh, change a lot. And this is very useful because it prevents uh, rent seeking. It prevents anyone from cornering all the products that you have because the price will change immediately. Uh, it's important also to incentivize the liquidity provider or depositor, the, the deposit, the dis, depositors to supply capital so they're being paid a fee. And sometimes they're being paid 0.3% or even more. Uh, when it comes to credit and lending beyond swapping the coins or the foreign exchange of the coin, uh, you, you can have two types of token. One type of token is like the shareholding or the governance. Okay, it, the, it's like make a doubt, they determines the governance, the voting rights, but, but really it is, it is like a, the liquidity provider of the last resort. Whereas the, the DAI is a crypto collateralized stable coin packed to US dollar that you, it is the US dollar in the crypto world where you can redeem any time for $1 worth of ether. So that is the $1 in the crypto world. It's not the same as being fully uh, um, backed by one US dollar, but by ether. So in credit rent lending, you, if you have the ether here, then you put it into the vault by the smart contract, then you mint it with DAI. So just think of this as something that's liquid, but you go to a pawn shop, you pawn it, and then you get whatever is liquid to use. This is the US dollar in the, in the crypto world. And what happens is that you can, you can um, exchange this something which is less liquid for something that is more liquid in the pawn shop. And of course, you can't get the full amount. You can pawn it for 667, which is 150%, or you can pawn it for 500, which is uh, of a collateralized ratio of two. So of course, the higher the collateralized ratio uh, is supposed to be safer, it's more stable, okay? So when, when the price drop tremendously for the object that you pawn, then uh, you either increase the collateral or you pay back the loan plus, plus the interest, or you'll be liquidated by the keeper. 
is no different from uh, the physical world that we know, but everything is done by smart contract without a third party or a pawn shop. And with all the tokens, you have seen that a lot of this digital art are selling in very high um, value. This is 6.6 .6 million, and there are some which are about 69 million and so on. And there will be real estate that's being sold in the metaverse. Uh, there will be a lot of other land that's sold in metaverse. And this is the new area of crypto uh, world that we're talking with decentralized finance. And these are the references. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, David, for this, this great uh, primer on, on uh, NFTs, tokenization, and distributed finance. Uh, I think you would uh, call for, for a lot of uh, unpacking. Um, and this is uh, also just a reminder to the audience that you may submit questions through the Q&A button. Uh, the, David and the panel uh, will uh, ad address these each time per if time permits. Now, let's get into our panel discussions. And first and foremost, allow me to, to introduce uh, our speakers and, and to thank them uh, for joining us today. Uh, from our very own Asian Development Bank, uh, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Stephen Beck, who has managed the exponential growth of ADB's trade finance program and implemented its first supply chain finance business. Um, Stephen is on the advisory board of the International Chamber of Commerce Banking Commission. Uh, and a member of the World Trade Organization Working Group for Trade Finance. And we'll get to talk about this uh, a little bit later with our next panelist. Uh, we at the Sandbox program had the privilege to work with Stephen to test a, a blockchain-enabled trade finance transaction a couple of months ago. So Stephen, um, uh, starting with you, could you please tell us where you see opportunities to leverage new technologies such as blockchains and, and others in your area of work? Stephen, please. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks very much for having me on the panel. Uh, pleasure to uh, pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I think we've got uh, uh, a very interesting moment in time where uh, uh, you know, out of the, the tragedy of the pandemic, we also have opportunities to move forward on some some very fundamental issues um, and, and, we're, and a recognition that digitalization can address many of these sort of issues of our time. Um, and I think that there is you know, a sense of urgency that's coming out of this sort of moment in time uh, that we need to seize upon. So, so what do I mean by that? I mean that, first of all, of course, we have to, we have to recover economically. This is the first thing. Um, and as part of that sort of economic recovery, um, uh, I think people realize now out of the pandemic just how important supply chains are. No one spoke about supply chains before the pandemic, before, you know, there was this sort of critical need to have PPE, you know, personal protective equipment or ventilators or vaccines and so on delivered uh, efficiency, uh, efficiently and, and the importance of that. Um, and now, of course, we see all sorts of disruptions in the supply chain and a recognition that we need to make supply chains more robust, more secure, and that it's critical uh, for the world to do so. Um, so, so that's that, that's one sort of issue. I think uh, uh, the second one is, of course, the environment as we come into these COP twenty six discussions uh, and the role that supply chains play. I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, a lot of pollution comes out of uh, out of the, the the world supply chains, right? And and digitalization is going to be a very important part of driving the kind of transparency we need in supply chains to be able to verify and monitor environmental standards. So, uh, you know, that's really going to be the way that we're able to, you know, on the ground, very realistically implement some of the sort of the, the overarching macro lofty environmental goals. So digitalization of supply chains is also very important uh, there. And then, and then finally, Mark, I would just uh, say that uh, the inclusion um, or leveling up or shared prosperity, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, closing those inequality gaps is also an issue of our time uh, that can also be addressed by digitalization. I mean, ultimately the dream, and, and uh, Oswald is doing some amazing work on the Digital Standards Initiative uh, uh, that's, uh, that's very germane to this issue, the, 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 the issue, uh, ultimately, the dream is to create seamless digital trade throughout the trade ecosystem, meaning from exporters 
to shipping, to ports, to customs, to warehousing, finance, and importers. And if we can make that whole process a seamless digital process, the kind of economic growth uh, that we could see coming out of that, and the ICC, I believe, today is coming out with, uh, with a study that shows some incredible numbers uh, in terms of economic growth, uh, in terms of the ability to generate metadata out of that kind of seamless digital trade that would, that would enable us to close a lot of financing gaps, including for SMEs and others that have you know, not been included as much in the global economy as could be, including women-led businesses. Um, so all of this comes really down to, to digitalization and the tremendous opportunity for us to address some of these problems uh, of our times. Um, and, uh, and it's a very exciting time to, to, to be in this space. So Mark, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. Uh, thanks for, for this uh, intervention. Um, and so maybe transitioning uh, smoothly to, to our next uh, speaker is, uh, is Oswald. Um, and you've mentioned him. Uh, Oswald, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. Uh, Oswald Kuller is the Managing Director of the International Chamber of Commerce Digital Standards Initiative. And uh, we at ADB, through our trade finance program, uh, we're doing work with, uh, with this uh, initiative. Um, so Oswald, first and foremost, thanks a lot for, for joining us. And I'll ask you the same as Steve. Could you please tell us where you see opportunities to leverage new technology? again, such as blockchain and others uh, in your area of work. Oswald, back to you, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks for everyone viewing for participating in today's session. What, I, what I'll do is I'll touch on two different topics. The first is on the digitization of trade and supply chain processes. And then what I'll do is I'll also touch on DeFi itself. So when we think about digitization of trade and supply chain processes, uh, one of the key challenges, and Steve was one of the first people to really identify you know, this gap, was the fact that over the last two, three decades of trying to digitize supply chain processes, we've really seen very little success in the terms of volumes. And so if you think about the Digital Container Shipping uh, Association, they released uh, a number, which was quite an interesting number uh, in December last year, uh, showing us all that about 1% through the midst of a pandemic of trade-related documentation, EBLs, were actually digitized at that point. So when we think about the opportunity stall that's left on the table, there's an enormous amount of opportunity there for us to actually work together to see how do we further digitize these processes to not just ensure that documentation is stopping, you know, vessels from discharging cargo and having businesses pay demurrage, but also so that we can open up so many new opportunities um, associated with digitization and access to financing. And so uh, again, working uh, through the ADB, Steve is on my board, which is fantastic. Uh, we're specifically focused on really two key things. How do we ensure that regulation matures so that people can legally transition onto digital platforms across the globe? And secondly, that we have some common norms and standards out there so that whether you're a small or big company, you know how to digitize information, which I think is very important. Now, when we think about DeFi itself, it has an enormous opportunity. The, the ADB famously have given us all insight into what the trade finance gap is. And a lot of people, when they see that number, see it as a theoretical number. It's very hard to truly understand what that is. But it comes back to entrepreneurs through the pandemic, as an example, whose balance sheets have changed. They're no longer what they were 18 months ago and needs to get access to financing and potentially the traditional systems aren't necessarily available to them uh, anymore. And secondly, when we think about innovators sitting across multiple different countries globally, potentially either due to location or access to the information, the documentation that they need, not being able to take that great idea and actually create that business that's actually going to change the way we all work. And we, we've seen over the last 100 years the big impact that a small handful of people can actually have on the way we all live and work. So it's, it's an important thing for us to solve. And when we think about DeFi, and, we think, and thank you so much to the professor for that great session, um, it has that opportunity of removing frictions 
out of the process of creating trust between two entities and bringing even more people into the actual cycle of both providing liquidity and supply and demand. I think there's a few important things though to, to touch on um, in addition to what was mentioned a little bit earlier is that not only is there a great opportunity because we can have more people participate and we can actually start resolving some of the trade finance gap uh, through that process, but we can also see a, a, a modernization, if you will, of some of the instruments that we are all leveraging. So through technology and through some of the great innovations and clarity that technology brings uh, further enabling that. There are some global norms that we have. We want to make sure that we don't necessarily finance uh, parties that might leverage that for benign reasons as one example out of many. So DeFi with all of the potential that it has still has some room for growth. We need to still test some of the smart contracts and some court systems uh, globally. But what excites me is if you just look at the last 12 months alone, if you look at the growth from about a billion dollars of DeFi uh, activities about 12 months ago, I, I had a look last night at something $90 billion today. So definitely growth, but definitely still some key areas that need to mature to ensure that we understand exactly um, how this great new technology can still align to some of the norms that we have as a society. Uh, so that's all from me for now. But uh, again, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for everyone who's joining today. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Oswald. Uh, great. Uh, and um, last but absolutely not least, I'd like to introduce our, our third panelist uh, on this session. Um, our, our next panelist is Mrs. Emmanuel Pechenicic. She's, she's based in Hong Kong, and Emmanuel is the head of BNP Paribas Asset Management Digital Strategy. Uh, as part of her role, Emmanuel is looking at increasing the usage of artificial intelligence, blockchain, and other digital technologies in BNP Paribas operating model and investment processes. Uh, Emmanuel is also the co-chair of the Blockchain Committee of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Uh, Emmanuel, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, I'll ask you the same question as your previous co-panelists. Could, could you please tell us where you see opportunities to leverage new technologies uh, in your area of work, please? Emmanuel, over to you, please. Sure. Thank you very much, Mark, as well for the opportunity. At BNP Paribas Asset Management, as an asset manager, we see the potential of blockchain impacting you know, our uh, business on two main areas. The first is how do we invest in those new digital assets that you know, the professor had just explained. So now it's a two trillion asset class, so how do we handle that in our portfolios? Then secondly, it's how to benefit from the tokenization um, aspect that offers the blockchain. So on this is how basically we can tokenize mutual funds share in order to enable distribution. So I will deep dive in both of those topics. So first on the digital assets. So right now we invest mostly on traditional securities. So we are investigating how tokenization can impact uh, equities, bonds, and as well alternative investment. What we believe is that on the alternative investment space, tokenization has a lot to offer. In fact, it can enable potential liquidity. If you think about it, as you tokenize, you know, let's say, you know, real estate or infrastructure assets, then after you could potentially, you know, list that, you know, secondary exchange and enable liquidity. So that's one of the potential, but it's just a potential because you don't create an exchange and a liquidity, you know, from one day to another. It takes a lot of time. So even you know, now there is not a lot of trading activity on those security tokens, but what it enables for us is that we can uh, finance smaller infrastructure projects thanks to tokenization, because with the token comes not only the financial instruments, but as well, a lot of data. That's the power of smart contracts. So we can embed a lot of information in the security itself. And thanks to that, we can, basically standardize the credit analysis. So uh, Oswald was talking the importance of standardization you know, in order to be successful you know, in um, implementing standard in order to be successful with decentralized finance. I think it's true as well for security tokens. 
So if you think about it, as we embark on you know, data, we can standardize credit analysis and all the aspects that go in, going with the project. So instead of spending a lot of time and energy, now we have standardized, we can quickly um, go to uh, uh, the issuer and you know, tell um, that issuing entity, so energy developer, for example, uh, that you know, the project has been improved, approved, and that you know, we can finance quickly, you know, for example, financial transition in a small area of an emerging country, for example. So that's really uh, one of the big advantage of tokenization, especially for infrastructure. Uh, on top of that, you know, uh, you will have on the network, so other data provider, um, you know, legal firm approving uh, things ahead, so really uh, improving the overall uh, process in, in, in the issuance as well. So there will be a, a lot of cost benefit uh, into this. So this is um, for us, you know, one of the most uh, attractive part of um, you know digital assets investing in alternative investment token secure. The second part is the issue, uh, the tokenization of mutual fund themselves, and I think it's really important for ADB because you know, as in Asia, there is a lot still a lot of issue around financial inclusion. Inclusion basically tokenization of mutual funds can enable a lot of people to have you know, investment solution at a fraction of the cost and with a small share compared to before. So, and this is as well the opportunity, right, of cryptocurrency. A lot of people invest into them like really small, small amounts and they can benefit and enjoy from the potential appreciation. But this is more difficult to access traditional investments. So this is what you know, enable tokenization of mutual funds. So on top of fractionalization, we can as well, same as before, have a lot of um, cost efficiency opportunities by bringing the distributors or the technology you know, partner, let's say an e-wallet, um, the asset manager, and um, you know, the settlement bank, the transfer agent, et cetera, all the actors around the value chain on the same network being aware at the same time of the information. So we can cut the settlement time as you know, instant settlement instead of daily settlement before. Uh, we can have uh, you know, a really small part, let's say of the money market fund or an equity fund. So uh, this is really attractive from, from that perspective. And on the cost uh, side, uh, we have seen example of equity funds being issued at the same price of an ETF. So it's an enabling, uh, you know, uh, a more active uh, asset manager to be able to compete again with a passive fund from a, a cost perspective. So um, that would be it on my side. But uh, you know, I hope that. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, the opportunity as well. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Emmanuel. Very interesting. Um, moving on, I, I'd like to look a little bit into the future and, and how we're collectively building a better future. Um, so maybe I'll ask each and every one of you, Emmanuel, Osval, and Steve, and maybe starting with, with Emmanuel, uh, if you could walk us through areas of work related to digital distributed finance that you're currently pursuing and, and where in the coming years or so uh, you'll be investing uh, efforts. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit about the anticipated impact of this work, um, especially about potentially creating opportunities that are inclusive and, and take into account the developing countries' needs. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to get us started on this, please? Sure. So as I said, we are um, into uh, alternative investment and especially infrastructure uh, debt tokenization. So we focus a lot on the energy transition. So we know that there is a financing gap over the coming year on the uh, energy on, on for the energy transition, and as we need to finance small project, let's say a solar panel project, you know, on our side we're looking at the, at the French market, but this could be applicable anywhere. So you know, on a small city south of France. So how do we finance this uh, 200k project? You know, uh, by in a simple way, and uh, as I said. So tokenization can really uh, you know, enable that and fasten the overall process. Before, in, just to give you some perspective, in our infrastructure fund, each line of the fund was about 10 million. 
right, uh, US dollar of investment. Now we'll be able to integrate a lot of assets, really small, something like around, you know, 200K US dollar, 300K US dollar, thanks to that standardization that come with tokenization. So this is something that uh, we are uh, spending along with, uh, uh, you know, our, um, you know, CIB folks and, you know, the digital asset custodian as well, uh, a lot of time on. And as you know, we will be able to uh, prove that we can make that really scalable uh, over the coming months. Uh, we think that this can be applicable as well to other alternative uh, areas like SME debt. Uh, we, we know, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, small enterprises struggle as well to access to, to capital because they can be underserved by banks. So this is really an opportunity to, to make a difference and to finance the real economy thanks to tokenization. Back to your question on the developing countries' needs, uh, I think, of course, you know, this new way of uh, finding, uh, I mean, raising uh, money for uh, companies can be really attractive for uh, emerging countries. It's uh, an opportunity, you know, to be closer to the institutional market to them. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, you know, as I explained on the distribution of uh, mutual funds, you know, for us, we are really thinking on how, you know, we can uh, help, you know, uh, small, um, you know, emerging economies and small uh, retail investors to basically uh, invest and start thinking of their future, you know, how do I start planning the education of my, uh, of my kids, how do I start planning my uh, retirement or my, uh, you know, else, any, you know, else, um, you know, um, I would say, uh, bucket of my savings I need to, to keep for health matters, I mean. So, you know, really tokenization of mutual funds can enable to, uh, to do that. And this is going in pair with, you know, uh, uh, other, um, you know, AI uh, and other digital capabilities we have built, such as robo-advisory, for example. So it's not tokenization in itself, but you need to combine it sometimes with other technology uh, impact in order really to, uh, to, to bring scale to, uh, to this. You're on mute, Mark. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Emmanuel. A very, very interesting uh, look into what, uh, what you're thinking about the future. Uh, Oswald, could I please go to you and tell us a little bit about, you know, what is it you're working on, what's, what's coming next, and how you think it will have impact? Over. Okay, thank you. And if I, if I talk too much, I'm going to need Stephen to dive in because uh, I can speak for an hour about the, this topic in the future. Um, what I might do is touch on three items. So the first is... Uh, in the, let's say in the short to, to midterm, one of the key things that we want to see is we want to see it becoming legal for people to actually transition or paper onto electronic files, regardless as to which country they're in. And the reason that's important is because a lot of, especially SMEs, are, are struggling to digitize their processes because the only way to get access to digitization of those processes are, for example, through fintechs that have private law contracts that enable on a private law level, the digitization of a lot of those processes. And while that works well, for example, in high margin industries like commodities, what we have seen is in retail and other locations where there's more complex supply chains and lower margins, it's definitely something that is uh, impacting the ability for a lot of organizations to actually digitize. So, so with A, we need to solve that. And that's one of the things that again, through Steve's leadership, we're doing at the DSI on a global level saying, how do we solve that? The second one is again, sharing of those norms. How do I produce this information so that in the short term, I can, I don't have to necessarily, and again, think about the SME. They don't use SAP for leave. They don't have big business process management systems. If they wanna produce a trade document, a lot of them just use Word and they use email and they use WhatsApp to negotiate it. So how do we enable this community to go online find the, the actual recipe for creating the trade related documentation that will work within the broader ecosystem. So that's the second thing. And these aren't 10 years out. These are things that we can achieve as a society within the next five years or so. And when you take that a few steps further, and again, I, I, I look back at the ADB trade finance gap report, 
it's not that 100% of that gap is caused by trade just all, you know, they're all being bad deals. That's not the case. A lot of uh, people that's being locked out, it's either because of uh, the, the margin of the deal not potentially being sufficient or there's a lack of information or there's a lack of documentation. And so we know that there's quite a large pool of reasons why people don't get access to liquidity that can actually be solved through digitization. So we can see how as we're, we're enabling these core pillars that we can see more SMEs, not just digitizing their processes, but actually getting access to trade finance. And we can see these new mechanisms actually expanding. And if I, to kind of close it off, and one of the interviews, and I think it actually was with my interview with Steve for the DSI was uh, the key reason for me, if I look into the future and I go, why are we all doing this? I can imagine someone sitting in my home country of South Africa, building an engineering drawing of creating some great innovation at being 3D printed in Australia, a bank out of, for example, the Netherlands are financing it. Another uh, company is potentially producing maintenance uh, contracts, et cetera. So fundamentally enabling this global community to leverage the talent, no matter where it is, and actually being able to share the value that's being produced, again, no matter where they are. So I can really see us unlocking that future, but, um, it's not going to come easy. It's not going to come cheap. And it's not just going to happen uh, because it's naturally going to happen. And this is where A, panels like today's is super important. But also a lot of the projects that we do through organizations like the ADB is instrumental to ensure that we can actually achieve that future. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Oswald. Um, Stephen, uh, moving on to you. Could you tell us a little bit about you know, your, your, your vision uh, what impact that vision could have, and and specifically as you are our own colleague, what ADB is doing to make it happen, Stephen? Thanks, Mark. Um, as many of our colleagues know, we have a trade and supply chain finance uh, uh, business, and uh, uh, we provide guarantees and loans to banks to close uh, gaps, uh, financing gaps uh, for for trade, uh, especially among SMEs. Uh, but doing those transactions isn't going to be nearly enough to close the gap. As uh, Oswald alluded, we put out a study uh, last week that showed um, that estimates a $1.7 trillion global market gap for trade finance that impedes our ability to, to generate the kind of growth and jobs that we need uh, for development and, and arguably more than ever now to climb out of this uh, economic mess out of the uh, out of the pandemic, so doing these transactions isn't going to be enough. Uh, uh, so we need to do uh, 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 a lot more. And as we've been discussing, digitalization uh, can help us generate the kind of metadata uh, uh, that we need to close some of these financing gaps for SMEs, for women-led businesses, and uh, and will also enable us. Uh, to, to develop the kind of transparency we need to uh, up the curve on sustainability and supply chains uh, and, and other issues. But there are some impediments to us uh, 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 moving forward on digitalization, which can address these issues. And one, as we've discussed, is a lack of global standards and protocols um, that'll enable us to, 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 to drive that interoperability that I was mentioning before throughout the, the sort of ecosystem, trade ecosystem. And so that's why we, uh, ADB, in partnership with the uh, government of Singapore and the International Chamber of Commerce, created the Digital Standards Initiative, which is this big tent that's bringing together uh, the private sector and ISO and, 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 and all stakeholders to uh, uh, develop uh, and, and uh, uh, promote standards and uh, uh, protocols for, for digitization. The second thing uh, that's impeding our development uh, on the digitalization is a lack of legislation. And so, uh, Mal, we're working closely with our colleagues on the sovereign side of the bank, the resident, the resident missions and the regional departments uh, to advocate that our developing member countries adopt laws that were developed by model laws that were developed by the United Nations on electronic documents. 
And uh, we're also partnering with, uh, with uh, Oswald and the Digital Standards Initiative to get that done as well as others. So those are some two, two very tangible things that ADB is doing uh, to, to move uh, you know, the, 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 certainly the region and the, and the world uh, towards, uh, toward digitalization. There are some other bits and pieces. We've been experimenting with some blockchain transactions in our uh, in our business, and not to refer to that. We're also looking at, um, at some uh, pilots in technology that would drive transparency, such that we could uh, monitor and link financing to labor standards through certain uh, industries, whether it's uh, cotton in India or or others. We're we're looking at so some very exciting developments there as well. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. Uh, this is great. And uh, conscious of the time, uh, I really want to thank you all, uh, the three of you, for this uh, this great uh, panel, uh, Emmanuel, Stephen, and, and Oswald. Um, and we'll pass the floor uh, to get a bit of a glimpse at what a DeFi platform can look like. Um, and so I would like to invite June uh, to join us on this session. Um, so June is the founder of the Halo Dao Foundation, and, and June has had a lifelong fascination with the increasing financial inclusion. Uh, he's previously worked at uh, the Ethereum Venture Studio at Consensus, um, and he's developed Halo Dao uh, along with uh, my own colleague Chris, uh, who has previously worked at Consensus. Uh, the purpose of uh, Halo Dao is, is to create Web3 infrastructure. Uh, to traverse the divide between conventional and decentralized finance. And so June will give us a flavor of what this is all about. Uh, June, the floor is yours, please. Um, hello, everyone. I'm June and I'm the founder of HelloDAO. So um, I heard the panel, very thankful for everyone. And I think uh, my job here today is to show you how it actually works um, and like uh, where is the next future of things. So I'll be sharing my screen right now. So um, this is uh, what HelloDAO is. HelloDAO is building a liquidity for non-USD stable coins. So think of it as like XSGD, which is a Singapore-backed uh, stable coin, um, fiat-backed stable coin, and there are others like the THKD, GBP, CAD. So one thing as we see in uh, DeFi now is that there's not a lot of liquidity for local fiat currencies, which means uh, people who want to interact DeFi often have to go through many hoops. So we're trying to build up liquidity for non-USD stables. So in this case, uh, what you're seeing is just a simple swap. I press the swap, I confirm it. And um, after this, uh, it will be recorded on the blockchain. So what you see here is that, um, well, we cannot draw, but what you're seeing here is um, my wallet has been uh, settled uh, into to Singapore dollar. So how do we go from here into like the development finance use cases? So I'll share my slides. So I think many of us would have heard like uh, the recent trends in XE Infinity and like play to earn. So one of the things we are doing is uh, how can we distribute funds to people um, and give them unsecured loans uh, when they have no credit history. So what's happening in DeFi right now is that people are building credit history unbanked. And the ways they do it is extremely exciting. Uh, in this case, what you see here is a bot on Discord. Discord is a messaging platform that looks like this, uh, where you can interact. And what happens is uh, these players will earn an income and we can track their. And from there, it is like having income statement from which you can generate like a credit score. From there, we use our lending market, which is Kasu, to lend to a guild. A guild is like a, a an intermediary organization that manages these scholars for the players. Um, and we distribute a loan to the players who previously are unbanked. So this is one way we see <clears throat> how DeFi is evolving, where um, it is not a situation whereby we disintermediate everyone, but it is actually putting the relevant um, intermediaries in place so that we can distribute money and trust the, the risk assessment uh, more effectively. So this is one of the ways. So if we think about it from the um, supply chain standpoint, you know, we would have a bank as, instead of actually bank, which is collecting all the income for these uh, uh, brokerage or firms and logistic firms or towards the, the bank 
and borrow it from a DeFi. You know, this um, allows everyone to trust the income and we can distribute the funds easily. <clears throat> another that that I can show today is uh, not mine, but um, another team's. So, finance, traditional finance. Buy. So, what you're seeing me load is called ribbon finance. Okay, I think it's loading. So, over here, what you're what we are seeing is um, actually people selling um, options. So let's say I had wanted to sell options. I'll be putting my ETH here into this vault. Um, there's no minimum. Um, and from there, it will be an option, a certain strike. Um, and premiums are paid so that it earns a yield. So you get like a projected yield of um, 8% a year if you put your, your liquidity here. So what's so special about D in this case? If you went to a traditional market maker in crypto and you wanted to sell options, the minimum you would have to do is 100,000 USD. But with, there's no real minimum, so to say. So it demonstrates the excess of, um, uh, of uh, financial to people. Um, and where are we going to go next uh, as we of these integrations? Uh, where we're going to go next is um, right now, most likely still on Ethereum. But as we move towards a multi-chain world, whereby you know transaction fees become lower and lower because uh, the tech is getting faster and faster, you know we see much more activity um, happening whereby more on-chain settlement will happen, and the uh, risk management of like how do you select the strike, for example, will happen off-chain. So there will still be a role of people in traditional finance, and you know there will be a very clear domain whereby crypto will succeed and to interact with each other and um, make things more efficient, so to say, in checking ownership, uh, et cetera. So this, these are some things that uh, I've read for you today and uh, hopefully this is a good takeaway given the limited amount of time we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, June. This is, this is great. And I hope it's, <laughs> it's giving the audience a bit of a flavor of what this is all about. And we'd be happy to, to arrange a more in-depth session. Uh, but yes, uh, due to limited uh, time, I will uh, need to, to wrap this session. Um, so allow me uh, to thank you, David, uh, Stephen, Oswald, Emmanuel, and, and June. Thank you so very much for giving us this, this very insightful uh, session. Uh, to all in the audience, uh, before we wrap up, uh, we ask that you do a 10 seconds poll. Thank you very much in advance. We, we appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'll ask the, the team to show the, the poll right now. Um, and before you leave, uh, I would like to invite uh, everyone uh, to attend the session tomorrow on the future of work and the evolving role of digital technology. And we'll hear uh, from the CIO with their perspective on, on this. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget, digital is now. Thanks very much.